Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. And this week we have a special guest. We have Tanya Jenka from the We Hack Purple Academy. She hosts the We Hack Purple podcast, author of Alice and Bob Learn Application Security. Tanya, why don't you give yourself a quick introduction and let people know where they can find you. Um, honestly, I was so tempted to say, and I'm Tanya, your guest. <laughs> I was like, no, <laughs> behave yourself, behave yourself for just a minute. <laughs> you should have, it would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so first of all, I'm silly. So my name's Tanya, and I am a person that is really obsessed with securing software. I was a dev for a really long time, and then I met an ethical hacker, and he talked me into joining the security team, and before I knew it, it turned out that there was this job I really liked, which was kind of working with the, the dev team to make sure that everything was secure, testing things, verifying things, helping them. and. It also turned out that I like public speaking. If you told me this after doing the first one where I thought I might die, I literally thought I might die. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have known, but then it turned into almost like a habit. Like I'm like, I have an addiction to social spe or uh, public speaking. I started speaking at like every meetup ever. And then I applied at a conference and honestly, I was super shocked. I got in, I was like, oh my gosh, what's happening? <laughs> and then I started doing it a lot. And then it turned out that um, I'm good at teaching things. And so that is what I do now. So I started my own company called We Hack Purple. And I teach basically like secure coding, how to be an application security professional, like all of those things. Because I discovered, I don't know, that makes me super happy. Yeah. <laughs> so it turns out there are jobs for everyone. And you can find that that special job that fits all of your weird personality quirks if that makes sense and yeah it turns out i i love teaching people and helping people and solving security problems we're super excited to have you because adam mm -hmm. and i we we talk about you know all the different tenets of information security and one of the weaker areas that we're in is application security you know we're strong in engineering and architecture and infrastructure but when it comes to application security, I think we're both fairly new to to the uh, the practice, so we're super excited to have you on. Thank you for having me. People suggested your podcast, and because oh, there's so many red you. red That's... team podcasts where it's like let's attack this, let's attack that, and your podcast is about <laughs> defense. And I call myself a purple teamer, but I'm like a royal blue purple teamer. I do like a lot <laughs> of defense. <laughs> so this well, is and, a good and, match. And, one, one of the points you make in your book, too, is that so much focus is on red team and on offensive uh, mm. attacking and that sort of thing. But most of us are blue teamers. That is the majority of jobs and roles out there yes. in the broader InfoSec, AppSec space. And so there's sometimes not enough focus on it. So you, you make that point very well in, in the book as well. Oh, thank you. I think there's there's also <laughs> just like... There's way more jobs. There's way more full time jobs that you can support your family on sort of thing right. in blue team because no one's like, you know, I want this person to come in and just like secure all the things and then leave a week later. No one ever wants that. They're like, no, I need that person to stay and keep working here and continue to secure everything. Mm -hmm. So how did you get into programming? What was what made you start down the path into IT? Um, one of my aunts is the first woman to ever graduate from computer science in Ontario, where I'm from. And then my other aunt graduated computer science, and then three of my uncles graduated computer science, and my dad graduated computer technology. And then my uncle made us a computer that would talk to us when we were little. And so then <laughs> my parents suggested that I might like a programming course. And as a teenager, I was like, I don't like anything that you think I'll like. And then I really liked it a lot. And then 
<laughs> and then I took three years of computer science classes in high school and then got a job working at like a big tech company in high school. Um, and then, yeah, when I announced, I, I'm going to study computer science in college. They're like, yes, we know, sweetie. We know. <laughs> um, exactly. No one was surprised. <laughs> well, that's awesome. And you mentioned um, that you you met an ethical hacker, and that's what really piqued your interest in kind of transitioning from dev to maybe application security? Yeah, I honestly had several really, really bad run-ins with IT security when I was a dev. And I was definitely like, there are a bunch of jerk faces that I don't ever want to work with. I like lots of things. So I did a stint in security in like 2007 doing like anti-terrorism activities for Canada. And like, I was like, this is hell, this is awful. Everyone's a dick. I just <laughs> really didn't like it. And I was like, I want to go back to my friendly devs and like drink Diet Coke and like eat passion flakies <laughs> together and just like, <laughs> just be, it's like, I don't know how to explain, but it's like softer. And I found security to have like a lot of hard edges. But then I, I met an ethical hacker and we actually became friends because he was in a band and I was in a band. And so I came up to him and I knew he was into music. And I was like, hey, my band wrote a song called Mandatory Dance Party. And we want to create a mobile app where if someone else has the mobile app installed and they get close enough, it does this beep, 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 countdown thing, and then they both have to have a dance party. And then we want to use the, <laughs> the altometer thing to tell if the person has danced enough to judge like who the winner is. And That's like, amazing. I'm like, do you want to do this with me or what? And he's like, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and then our bands played together and we became friends. And then he's just like, you have to come to security. You have to, you'll be so good at mm -hmm. it. And he's like, no. And he spent a year and a half convincing me. And then once I started doing it, I was like, everyone get out of my way. <laughs> I really <laughs> like this. And before I knew it, I like in months, I totally outgrown him. I was like, no, I know more than you now. Get out of my way. I need a better mentor. And I was just like, rawr, rawr, rawr. it's so interesting because like with programming, you do the thing and then it works. But with security, there's just so many layers to this onion. <laughs> And also, when you do security, you don't work on one project or two projects. You could be on all the projects. So then it's like, it's so cool. I get to see what everyone is doing or most of the people. And yeah, it became, I guess, like kind of addic addictive. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I just really liked it. And I find that there's always cool, new, interesting things to learn. But I also am like quite a softy. And sometimes the security industry and like kind of, like some of the places that I've worked, the culture was very intense, very challenging. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, like challenging towards me, like you don't know enough. Um, you're, you know, you're not good enough. And I'm just like, get, yes, I am get out of my way. And for whatever reason, I've always had this confidence of I can do anything. Um, but I could see how a lot of people get kind of discouraged because I had so many places. Just, I don't want to hire you. You don't have X number of years experience. Like, Yes, you do. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's still a you know a problem in the industry, right? Yeah. The the job descriptions ask for yeah. so you know so and so <laughs> experience, these type of cer certificates. Oh yeah, entry and level I position, think... five years experience, seventeen certs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I actually, like, people will write me and say, like, could you help us find someone for this? And I'm like, oh, do you realize I don't qualify for this job? And I wrote the book literally right. on this topic. And I don't yeah. qualify for your job. Do you think you want to adjust it? Yeah. <laughs> that might be a good I place to start. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Speaking of the book, how, what kind of inspired you to write it? There it is. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's not very much no, space for, for my face, so I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I'll stop. Adam and I have have both read. Um, I haven't gotten through the whole thing yet, but uh, I think we've both read um, a majority of the book, and I, I think it's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, you've got you've got at least two sales here. That's for sure. <laughs> yes. So when I wanted to switch to security, so I think I had the best introduction like and 
and kind of onboarding into security that any person has ever had. So first of all, I had a professional mentor and he he hired me for my first contract. He literally went in and was like, if you don't hire Tanya, I'm not coming. And he like just like pushed open the doors for me. And then I joined OWASP. I became one of the leaders and the other leader, Shreve Kusa, he taught me so much. And then he just opened a zillion doors for me. And it, all these different people within the community in Ottawa were just like, they would just bend over backwards to teach me things, show me things, help me. Like out of this world, the best possible, softest treatment ever, right? And just a lot of people don't get to have that. Like how many people have a person that's super senior in their field go into an interview and say, if you don't hire Tanya too, I'm not coming. Like mm -hmm. that's such a gift, right? And so, but I still found it hard. So I went to the library, I took out like every security book. I'm like, you suck, you suck, you suck. This is not teaching me what I wanna know. And mm -hmm. I listened to every single podcast I could listen to. And I would go back and listen to the entire thing because I'm one of the, I'm like a sponge. I'm like, I want to know everything about the thing. And so mm -hmm. um, I was like, why is there no book that I can just read? Why is there no course that I could take? Because like there are courses called like Certified Application Security Engineer that teaches you nothing about how to do the job of AppSec. It's like, so it's nice that you have some secure coding basics in here and like a little bit about design, but it's like, it's not even like, it's not even a toe in the water. And also like, how do I do my job? How do I do my job? I wanna know, please. And so that's why I started We Have Purple because I was like, why is, and that's why I wrote the book. I was just like, why doesn't this exist yet? And I, and when like I got contracted to do it, so publishers kept writing me and saying like, we like your blog, you should write a book. And I was like, no one's gonna read a book by me. I'm no one. And they're like, no, like, you know, a lot of stuff and you have this special way of explaining. Um, so I am dyslexic. I'm considered in Canada disabled because I'm learning disabled. But it's not that I can't learn. It's just that I kind of need to take things from a couple different angles. Right. So I need to like maybe do some hands on and then read about it and then hear a story about it. And then maybe I need to write it out and, or whiteboard it. And so in the book, I tried to explain things in, in as many different ways as I could. So, you know, something will happen to Alice and there'll be a little story about it. And then I'm like, maybe there'll be a little bit of code and then there'll be an example. And then I'm like, oh, maybe there's time for a diagram. Right. And I only got to have exactly 250 pages. <laughs> so I had to like be pretty <laughs> concise, but I feel like I wanted to show, I wanted to make it easy to learn. Cause I find there's a lot of amazing books from security but it's like, type this into the command terminal, press enter, you're a hacker. And, it, and it's very, very like this setting. And then it's changed by the book, by the time the book is published sort of thing. And I'm like, I really want it to be someone that's not superbly technical, could still read a large part of the book and get it. Or someone that doesn't, that hasn't been a dev can still read most of the book and get it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So a lot of people in IT or other areas of security have told me they've read it. And they're like, that's what they're mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. I found it to be it, it's really interesting easy to, to hear you. Sorry. <laughs> I'm Canadian. We apologize even when it's not our fault. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> that is great. No, what I was going to say is it, it, it was interesting to hear you explain uh, two, two points. One, the way you use different methodologies of explaining the concepts, because now as they think back to the, the time I've spent reading the book over the last two weeks or so, I think of like, oh, you gave a story, you gave a diagram, you gave specific code or an example, and it really resonated with me too. And, and then the other thing too is it, an, another person whom I really really admire that also deals with dyslexia in the technical space is um, Donna Sarkar at Microsoft. And she's very open and, and out about it that she she has that. And she is amazing as kind of the the public face of Power Platform. And she uses that platform to, to kind of advocate for anybody can code. And even if you have had learning disabilities or other challenges, mm -hmm. you know, technology is for everyone. Yeah. And, and so I, I admire you for being so open and, and out about that, but it's, um, 
you wrote a heck of a book so you know well done on your part because it's 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 so written at an approachable level i thought the same thing of i i I consider myself reasonably technical and and at the same time i didn't feel like it was pandering it was at just the right level so i i really like it and andy and i are definitely going to tell everyone who listens to to go grab a copy but thank you thank you so much this is uh is i can't tell you what it's like to work really hard on a project for like two years and then have people like have it affect people in such a positive way it's just like it's so great it's really great <laughs> yeah I, I found it to be a, a very easy read even though it's really considered a textbook right it almost yeah. felt you know like you're reading a story uh for yes. the most part or or you just kind of talking to me and breaking it down in your experiences like i felt like you put a lot of your personal experiences where you, you have almost like the cliff notes of your career and you've encountered something and you're like, mm, this is what you should do. And mm-hmm. this is what you shouldn't do. So yeah. like the, uh, like the Alice and Bob, um, house analogy. I, I love that analogy where, you know, you're making a secure design for something. Right. And then mm-hmm. if you start building the house and then you have to put in a bathroom later on, like as in build in security later on, yeah. it can be very difficult. And expensive. So, and the solution is usually really not ideal. Like you have to give up your walk-in closet, or for mm-hmm. instance, you have to use some sort of older protocol, or you have to have like all these extra things around stuff and your latency sucks. Yeah. Putting in yep. security later costs a fortune and also gray hair. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so if you if you read the book mm-hmm. and you read some of your um published material and you f- follow on uh, on Twitter people start to realize that you're very passionate about security headers. So <laughs> if you can let our listeners know because not everybody knows you know what security headers are so if you can just kind of give a brief uh, breakdown of what security headers are and why (laughs) you are so passionate about them okay security headers are a little line of code that you put in your app um, or that you trigger on the server that are like it's like putting your seatbelt on in a car generally your seatbelt does nothing it is like very little effort and it does nothing for you, except when there's an emergency. And so this one line of code for whatever security header or hopefully you've used a whole bunch, protects you as like an additional layer of security when something happens. So for instance, let's say content security policy header. So that's like the big, really hard, most complicated one. And it's actually more than one line of code. It's a couple lines, but it does all sorts of things, but the one thing I'll talk about is cross-site scripting. So OWASP, who are like the open web application security project, so they're a huge community and I love them <laughs> and I'm a part of them. And they say that cross-site scripting vulnerability is in around two thirds of apps. So that's terrifying. So there's a good chance that of all the apps where you work, one of them has it. And so whenever a bad person, a malicious actor, is going to execute cross-site scripting, they always call out to somewhere else to get a big script. So let's say there's like a search field and they're going to put something in the search field. They can't put like 4,000 lines of JavaScript in there. It'll get cut off. But they want to use 4,000 lines of JavaScript worth of badness on you. So the first thing it'll do is be like, do they have cross-site scripting? Score. Now I'm going to try to call out to my super evil script in some other place. But if you have the content security policy header on and it says, listen, I only accept scripts from, you know, within my domain, or perhaps I let, you know, let's say I use Google Maps in my app. And so I'm like stuff from google.com domain and stuff from, you know, here and from my domain and everything else. No, thank you. It'll just, that attacks over. You're, you're safe. And it was With CSP, it's like two or three lines of code. But then you're just safe. Like life is good. (laughs) And and a bunch (laughs) of the security policy, like the security headers do different things like that. Like one makes sure that you're only over TLS. So like HTTPS only. 
And so if someone tries to put in HTTP, they're like, oh, no, thank you. Sorry. We're just going <laughs> to we're just going to forward you on to HTTPS. Oh, you really want that? Well, then we're not going to serve you. Bye. <laughs> and then that protects people, right? And it's like this one line of code, except for CSP, which is like three. But it's very, very little effort. And then like life is good. But devs often don't love that because they're like, you know what's easier if I just put star dot star. So my resources are from star. No. When you put the asterisk, <laughs> that's like saying, hey, bad guys, come on over. <laughs> Right. And I know it takes like a little bit of effort, but you could just look through your code for all the places where you're calling stuff, add all those domains. And if it's broken still, then there's something going on, right? Like I make it sound like it's zero effort. It's not zero effort, but it protects you against so many risks. I actually love security headers so much. Um, I just give so I give like live training, right? Um, but mostly it's on demand on our website, but I'll come in and do live training. So we're doing this secure coding training and I really love Star Trek. And so I had four different security header memes that were Klingons <laughs> specifically. <laughs> and so like there's Worf and he's like, what do we watch? And then all the Klingons are like raising, you know, like those big sharp things that they have and they're like raising it above their heads and they're like, we want security headers now. I'm like, don't mess with the Klingons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's good advice they tolerate my jokes and it's good <laughs> but i i it's a great way to educate though it really helps yes yes and i also feel like um doing layers of security is important because nothing's foolproof right mistakes happen and what if you know you have a brand new person on your team that comes on and they accidentally push some bad code and then that security header could save your derriere and I think that just like the, there's so many very complex, very difficult to implement security defenses and security headers just aren't that. They're just not that difficult. And that's why I'm like, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you put on your seatbelt? Why not? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm in Canada, you have to. If you don't, you're in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's it's any any time you have something where the the effort versus benefit is incredibly great, you you really push on it. So a lot of what I do is identity based security, and so you you hit this in the book as well. But I hit all the time multi factor authentication over and over and over and over. You know, it reduces your risk of compromise by ninety nine point nine percent. There's literally nothing else you can do that is that effective. So go do that. It might be a little challenging in some parts, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Yes. The payoff is there. And so I, I completely relate in that's how I kind of compare it to, to something I work with a lot. Literally all the time people try to hack my Twitter account because when you get enough followers or enough whatever, people will try to hack your accounts. And I'll just laugh. Sometimes I'll live tweet, oh, some losers trying to reset my password, but <laughs> you don't have MFA. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll just taunt them because I'm a jerk. Um, <laughs> but I feel safe because I have MFA. Yeah, I'm a big proponent of multi-factor mm -hmm. for sure. One I thing I, I saw in your book that I thought was super interesting that you called out, kind of switching gears a little bit from security headers, was you talk about there's this this kind of general logic that anything that's open source is magically more secure because there are your your open source fairies that go around and evaluate all that code and look for all the security weaknesses for free because, you know, they're nice guys. And and this is it, it's like common accepted knowledge that people just say that, you know, like it's a fact. And I love what you had to say about it. Can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit for us in our audience? So my friend Sharif Kusa was the first person that brought this up with me. So he did a research paper and compared a whole bunch of proprietary versus open source frameworks and their vulnerabilities and was like, look, it's pretty much the same. And people, so people will say, oh, oops. Obviously, I should have had my phone off. Um, it like never rings. Um, I only have like four people on my year allowed to make my phone make noise list. Anyway, <laughs> my parents can wait. <laughs> That's who calls me on Saturday night. Anyway, so <laughs> I feel like um, 
that I'm distracted. I'm sorry. <laughs> I literally forget the question because I'm laughing at myself that the only people... We were talking about the, the open source is oh, yes. not inherently more yes. secure yes. kind of okay. conversation. So there are 1.5 million jobs in North America estimated for which there's no qualified security person to do them. So that's where people are like, I have lots of money. Will you please come secure my apps? And people are not going and doing it. The fact that people think that people who have the skills to do this are going to review your code for free and send it to you out of the goodness of their heart and not sell it as a zero day on the black market for money or instead participate in a bug bounty program and report it there for money or get a full-time job doing it because... Literally, companies write me constantly, do you have new grads because we need to hire all of them? Because like, it's so hard to find a qualified security person. And so I think it's hilarious that people are like, oh yeah, there's these magical, wonderful angels that float around open source projects and just perform security functions for free. Do I, do I think that there's zero of them? No, but do I think it's enough to ensure that those apps are secure? Absolutely not. Whenever um, people are asking me, oh, I wanna get into InfoSec, and I want practice on these things, I suggest, you know, find an open source project and ask them if they want you to submit security bugs and then compile their app, run it locally, smash, smashy, smash, smash, do all the things you're gonna do and then report it to them. But ask first, because most of them won't appreciate it. A lot of devs don't feel nice when they receive bugs. They're like, hey, why are you messing with my crap? That's unnecessary. They're not all going to enjoy your efforts. And so find someone that's going to appreciate you and like hopefully put your put your name on, like let you join their project because that would be awesome, right? If you're mm -hmm. trying, and then you can say to an employer, like, look, I found like 12 bugs and help them fix them. I'm awesome. You should hire me and pay me to do this for you. Um, but yeah, I'm with you, Adam. Mm-mm. <laughs> it was it was definitely news to me too because i thought the same thing as adam you know anytime it's open source i, I think oh it's great it's open source then you know it's going to be more secure but when you said that it, it totally made sense that you know people aren't just going to do this for free so the, the other thing with like a proprietary framework so i used to work at microsoft and um there's this guy named barry dorans i used to work with it he's like the dot net security dude and he is serious about security <laughs> and it's literally his job to ensure the framework is the absolute most secure it could possibly be and he works full time and has a team that literally do every single thing they can to just make it secure out of the gate right and so you have full-time people being paid to do this versus no one being paid to do it and i well some open source projects are supported and funded but the majority are not so for instance like um, the Linux Foundation is, is awesome. They do a great job. But most open source projects, that's not the case. Like I had an open source project and our apps were intentionally vulnerable, but guess what? It turned out there were a bunch of vulnerabilities there we didn't plan, which <laughs> I just told them was a bonus. <laughs> that's an extra <laughs> feature, not a bug. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, when when I was a dad, so, I, I made a shirt that said, it's a feature, not a bug, and then wore it to meetings with the QA team, and they told me to stop being so passive aggressive. I'm like, I feel it's just aggressive. I don't feel it's like passive aggressive. <laughs> anyway. I mean, Andy and I are from the Midwest. We, we know a thing or two about passive aggressive. <laughs> That's our specialty. So one of the things, um, as I read through your book, you know, I, I'm not a coder, I'm not a dev, um, I do, you know, security architecture and engineering for a company, a blue teamer by trade. Yeah. But what I found was super interesting was by reading your book, mm -hmm. one of the things that I do commonly, and I think a lot of people at enterprises in security do common, is review vendors. And when you're talking to a vendor and asking them about their application, all of a sudden, it's like I have enough information to be dangerous to write, ask the right questions to say, hey, are you doing this? Are you doing this? And it came in handy. Um, I actually quoted your book on a call yes. and you know, I was asking them these questions and they couldn't, they couldn't answer them. And I said, well, you know, you're going to have to answer them and find out and, and come back to me before we 
give you a yes or no on this application. So, you know, I found a, a couple common themes that you kind of go through that, you know, I think can apply to any time you are talking to a vendor, you know, uh, as I'm reading through your book, you, you know, are, are you validating your inputs, encoding your outputs? Um, oh, yeah. You know, is your, are you making sure your application fails gracefully? You know, like you talk about it uh, failing to an unknown state. Is that what it's called? Yeah. You never want to fail into an unknown state or fail open. You always have to reverse whatever transaction you did and close and then start again if there's ever a question. Yeah, you don't want someone to pay for a thing and not receive the order for it. There's like a thousand other examples, but yeah, if someone sends in an order for a coffee and they pay, but then you don't receive the order because there's some sort of unknown state situation, or what if you think they ordered a hundred coffees? So you roll back star again and be like, sorry, there's an error, let's do this again. Take it from the top. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and. Speaking of uh, validating inputs, you know, I, I wanted to kind of get your feedback because you talk about uh, password requirements in the book and, uh, you know, where you're validating uh, certain requirements when you enter in a password. I've encountered, you know, and there's still people out in the field um, who encode their apps like this where they put an upper limit on a password, you know, like eight characters or ten characters, and I think that's nuts. Like, do you... Have you encountered that or what What are your thoughts on, on upper limits for password fields? So I do think there should be an upper limit, but maybe 200 characters because past that it, it doesn't really matter um, from an entropy and a randomness perspective. Like if you're going to use a whole bunch of graphics cards to try to guess over and over and over this password, mm -hmm. if there's 200 random characters, you're just, it's until quantum computing comes, it's a waste of time and energy. But yeah, one of, there was a bank and they said it was a maximum of 20 characters. And I went and I closed my account and they're like, you just opened this account. I'm like, this is completely unacceptable. And the poor little teller is <laughs> just like, well, I'm like, let me explain what entropy is. So <laughs> like, it has to be long enough that it's difficult to guess. You know what else I don't like is complexity demands. So there must be a number, there must be an upper, there must be a lower, there must be a special character. It's like you're training people to make it as short as possible because you've made it so difficult to remember. And I personally use a password manager for literally everything. I know almost none of my passwords and that is wonderful because as you can imagine as a CEO, but also as like a hacker person dev, like the number of passwords that I have to maintain is staggering. And so I use a password manager and it remembers all the passwords for me. It generates super random passwords. It tells me if two of them are the same and then shakes its little face at me. And um, it also tells me, oh, there's multi-factor. Why don't you have that turned on yet, Tanya? I'm like, yes, I feel your mm -hmm. shame. Thank you for letting me know that one password. <laughs> um, must, yep, I was gonna say it must be one it password. It sounds like one password, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, um, but for the average person, like I tell my parents, you know, make it a little joke or a little story or like a song lyric. Like um, the, I'm trying to, like there's, I really like karaoke, so I'm thinking of <laughs> songs that I hear a lot of karaoke. But I'm like, pick like a song lyric that you'll always remember, and it'll be nice and long. And and mm -hmm. then I don't know, add a add a seven on the end or whatever to like meet the stupid requirement. But because it's a sentence, you'll have a capital, you'll have a lower, and then the period will be your thing. But it'll be really long. So don't make it password one, please. Um, or yeah, you know. Winter 2021, which is right now the number one most used password in English speaking countries. Exclamation mark. Winter 21. Yeah, exclamation mark. mark. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. You know, I think, um, you know, when it comes to passwords as a security community, I think, you know, we honestly need to do better. I actually went and migrated all of my wife's passwords um, and accounts to multi-factor. We use one password as a family as well, you know, I ha and I manage her thing. But when I was doing it, you know, it because forever. I do it all the time, it, it's fairly standard for me to go into an account, turn on multi-factor, scan the thing, um, put it into one password. But, you know, she was sitting next to me 
um, watching me do this, and I yeah. honestly could not imagine her doing it. You know, it, it, for the regular Joe, it is not a normal thing. Yeah, we use one password at my company, and I'm the only technical person at my company. So I make all the content, and then I make them do like business things like marketing and other crap that I'm not interested in. <laughs> <laughs> like, hire smart people to do the stuff that you don't want to do, slash, aren't good at, which is right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Like there's one person who helps me manage my social media and I've had to reset her one password like so many times and reinstall it for her. She's just like, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And she gets really frustrated. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just like, like for me, one password is the like, so this isn't supposed to be like me selling. I don't get anything. I just like them. Um, and not mm -hmm. only because they're Canadian, but Basically, like, it's still quite complex as an activity and for a non-technical person, like me explaining to them. So, like, a new feature that they came out with that I totally love is that when you log in, it will copy the one-time password code for the multi-factor, if you've saved it in there, to your clipboard. And then you just press paste. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go and get it. You just press paste. And then it copies back whatever was on your clipboard, which I'm like, mm, that's, that's usable security. <laughs> I love that. So I'm like... Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm with them, and they're like, Tanya, I don't have the code. I don't have the code. I'm like, press control V. And then they're like, no, I don't have the code. I don't. And I'm like, just just please press control V. And then they do, and then it's there, and then they feel stupid. And it's like, I am not trying to make you feel stupid. Of course, you couldn't guess it's going to do that, right? But mm -hmm. I'm trying to train you to show you how to do it. And then they're like, it's pretty handy. I'm like, yeah. Right. And they're like, well, what about what was on my clipboard? I'm like, it will be back in 30 seconds. And they're like, oh, you have the answer for everything. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> I, but, it, but you know what I mean? And like, you know, these are grown adults that are, are frustrated with trying to do this. And I'm like, listen, if like, I'm not going to let you do this unless you're using MFA, like you work for a security company. I don't care. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I have that same thing with our company. We use LastPass Enterprise for the company, although mm -hmm. I use one password on the personal side. And, uh, you know, there's so many times when I'm trying to explain, we use shared folders for shared secrets and all this other stuff and people, you know, just, it doesn't click with them and it's, it's difficult. And, and I can empathize with that because, oh, yeah. you know, I, because I've used it for years, I understand how it works, but it, it, it's not easy, you know? And one of the tricks I tell people, you, you were talking about your parents where they, um, you use a song lyric or something like that. Yeah. I tell people when they set up their last password or one password or whatever it is your your master password right yeah i tell them think about the password that you use when i if i were to tell you to use a super secret password like for your bank or something like that or your email think that one in your head and then just type it twice because now you've increased the length but you know the password you just need to type it twice right that's so smart so, andy i'm stealing that's a that little trick <laughs> yeah that's a little trick I used for, for a lot of people because you know, so you've already increased their security because you've doubled the length, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. You, like, when I was writing the book, some of the things that I feel are obvious um, or that are so ingrained that I think all the people know, they don't know. And sometimes um, my technical editors were like, everyone already knows that, Tanya. I'm like, this book's from the beginning. And a lot of things, it turns out people didn't know them. And that's why, um, I guess, because like, like a lot of people will write very, very advanced security books. And I'm like, what about for people that are like, I'm a really smart person, but I don't know anything about this topic. What about those people? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like they're super smart, but they don't have that knowledge. So how can we just get it to them? I'm really glad you two liked my book. Thank you. Seriously. <laughs> well, what, what, one thing you called out in the book, too, that's interesting is you said your employer should provide you with a password manager and totally agree. Um, it sounds like, Andy, your company does. And, and Tanya, you, you do as, mm -hmm. as, you know, the owner operator of your organization. Mm -hmm. I work for a really big company. I work for Microsoft. We don't have a company provided password manager. Um, but then again, I literally do have only one credential for everything I do. I, I have one account 
you know, and it's single, single sign-on across the board. So, you know, I, I wonder if maybe there would be value in that, but it, it's a, it's an interesting point because I've been at other employers where certainly I had a ton of passwords to manage and it would have been incredibly helpful. So oh, yeah. it, I, I like that call out because I think that's something people should think about. And then, you know, on the whole password topic in general, a lot of your password guidance you give in there is aligned now to things Microsoft is saying NIST. or um, NIST, NIST, exactly. And it's amazing how that messaging has not gotten out still. You know, oh, yeah. uh, that Microsoft password guidance was published in like 2015. Those NIST guidelines were updated in like 16 or 17. And I still talk to customers all the time and I say things like, you should stop rotating passwords. Yeah. And they look at me like I have a third eyeball. And it's like, <laughs> I, t- I tweeted end user cruelty, stop password rotation now. And you would not believe mm-hmm. how many people responded saying you're a stupid woman. And like, obviously you need to rot. How will you ever have good security if you don't rotate passwords? And then I very patiently explained. And then I was like, but also I'm blocking you because you can go to hell for being rude. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, I'm still going to explain the lesson to everyone, but lots and lots of people were like, yeah, definitely. But lots of people were like, I didn't get that memo. Explain. I'm like, yes, I'm getting people to pay attention. Yes. By making silly jokes. But seriously, I, I, I used to have this big group of friends that were all PhD biochemists because you meet one and then just before you know it, you're surrounded by biochemists. I don't know. But anyway, they're, <laughs> I, I'm still friends with them like years and years later. But anyway, one of them was telling me, so they all work in this lab and then they all had to have all these different passwords and they all rotated 90 days and there was all these stupid rules. And so they all just had post-it notes on everyone's desk. So she's like, it's really convenient because then I can just log in as anyone and then update their samples for them. So, you know, if someone's sick and like their mouse needs whatever, then I can just be like, oh, I'll just log in. And I'm just like, ah. <laughs> and then I explained what a password manager was to this woman who's like this brilliant scientist. And she's like, that would be amazing. And so I helped her write a letter to her IT department asking for it. And they said, only IT people get it. You should just memorize them. And if you don't, you're stupid, basically. Like they didn't say stupid, but they're like, you're a failure as a user. And I was like, he's wrong. I'm sorry. That person (laughs) fails at life. Again, (laughs) that comes up a lot though, where and I always try to take this this tact whenever I'm talking to someone who is less technical and they're like, I'm just bad at computers or I'm dumb with computers. I don't know how to do this. And I always say, listen, this is not a failure with you. This is a failure with the software that it's not intuitive for you to use. If yeah. it is complica- complex or hard to grasp, that's a failure on us. And we need to do better as an industry and as user experience designers and usable security um, yes. practitioners to get to that place. And that's not on you. That's not something you yeah. should feel as a deficiency with you or your, your personhood at all. Yeah, we no. like the fact that people have to memorize a ton of passwords is a complete failure. Like our industry... Mm-hmm. He's not doing a good job (laughs) Um, and we're trying to change it. And I understand how we got into this spot in some situations, but yeah, usable security is really important because otherwise everyone will go around it. I, I remember someone who was a pen tester who did a pen test at the hospital and he told me, he's like, oh, it was great. So you know how like doctors and nurses, super smart, but don't know tech stuff, right? So yeah, a nurse was just like, oh, yeah, if you want to go to that, you just go to this proxy page and then you can just go outside of the little blocky thing from the IT people and then you just go wherever you want. And like, this is like a person that definitely didn't have, she's like, yeah, oh, we have it bookmarked. It's on the desktop. <laughs> yeah. And then he went into one of the exam rooms and they had this thing where if you didn't use this sample thing for more than five minutes, it would log you out. And so doctors had to log in like 3000 times per day. So they just put like a little plastic cup on top of the sensor. So it always seemed like someone was at it. And they're like, oh good, finally we can do our jobs. And he's just like, (laughs) And, and you know, then he had to give a report and he's like writing the reports really hard because doctors have to get their doctoring done. Don't get in the way. Like if someone's in surgery, they don't have time to log into crap. Like that's not acceptable. And so he was like telling the security team off and he's like, I am so not getting hired back there next year. And like, 
do you know what I mean? And he's like, I have to like walk this line of like, do I give them good advice or do I get the next contract or, and he was like trying to explain to them and they're just like, we're going to go punish those doctors and take away their cups. It's like, no, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not their fault. We talk about it all the time. Me and Adam on the show, the balance between uh, usability and security and, you know, yeah balancing the needs of the business or the users, right? You can't hamstring them to the point where they can't do their jobs, right? But you still yes. need to do usable security. Yes. You got to try to secure it to a certain point and then past that, you know, it's a it's a measurement of risk what the company is willing to do and yeah. you know, to try to mitigate that. Like it's our job to reduce the overall risk of where we work till it or like we're contracted to or whatever, to a risk that the organization can handle. And sometimes that doesn't mean doing the super fancy techie thing. Like um, I help a lot of people automate at sec things and like do DevSecOps and cool stuff like that. But I'm always like, so is there a thing that keeps you up at night? Is there like that one app that's like such a piece of garbage? It's like, you would describe it as a flaming dumpster fire. And they're like, oh yeah, I'm like, can we please spend some hours on that so I can make it so it doesn't make you cry? Because as a pen tester, well, I was a pen tester, now I'm an app sucker. But my first thought is like, oh, what's the oldest piece of crap here? I'm gonna start there, right? And that is what malicious actors do. And so how about, you know, we do some harm reduction, right? I'm not gonna make it beautiful and shiny and new, but I will make it quite difficult to get into. And if someone does get into it, they can't get anywhere else in your org. Could we please do that? Could you give me like 5K so I could do some stuff? And they're like, okay. Because like, we want to do the cool, super fancy cutting edge things like cloud security, yes. Let's do zero trust, yes. But also like legacy is still on your network, which means it's still a risk. Oh, did you just buy a new company? Cool, when do I get to meet them? Because I want to see what garbage they're bringing with them. Because that's where, like, yes, I want to, like, I want to do cool stuff that I can speak about at a conference so I look like a smart person. But I also know that we have to look at the org as a whole because it doesn't matter which way they get in. It just matters that they did. Right? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. It doesn't always you know, make it, me popular, though. <laughs> I, I just remembered, a, a, I think it was a true story that you put in the book. And I found that this was, this is a great question that you can ask, you know, your internal folks at any company, I think you were talking about um, risk and, and threat modeling, and you had asked a, a team, how would you break into your app or how would you hack your app? And they, and they said, you know, we have this admin portal that we put in there to like get, you know, from home, and you wouldn't have found out about that. And so I, I found that to be really useful because if I ever, you know, we're, we're trying to build an AppSec program at my company, and, oh, cool. and that's probably going to be one of the questions that I ask them is, you know, if you had to hack your app, how would you do it? It is the right? best way to start a threat modeling conversation. I was actually meeting with someone yesterday, and he was saying to me, yeah, like, I don't like the stride model, because when I say to them, like, so how could someone spoof things, or what about repudiation? They look at me with, like, these big, I don't understand you eyes. I'm like, don't ask them that. Instead say, so like, what if I could pretend I was you, right? Like, what if I like took over your session? Like, what damage could I do? Could I order shoes on the internet with your credit card? Could I uh, delete your bank account? Like, what could, what could I do if I'm like putting on my evil Tanya hat, right? And then we go on about that. I'm like, okay, so spoofing, these are the risks. And like, I'm like, so how could someone probably like try to steal the session? Like, could they do this? Could they do that? And then. I, I was actually threat modeling like with someone earlier this week and it turned out like there were no sensitive data and the session just told them how long it was taking for you to complete a course. And I'm like, do they get, is there like a time limit? They're like, no. I'm like, do they get more points if they've done it? They're like, no. It's just so that we can, it's only for our internal records so that we can see like, oh, this takes around 20 minutes, this one takes 15 minutes. So then we put in like our literature. Like on average, it takes people 15 minutes to complete this. I'm like, so would you say the information sensitive? They're like, no, it's like has almost no business value whatsoever. I'm like, okay, well then your like low amount of protection you're doing is fine. I don't care. They're like, what? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, there's <laughs> almost no risk to the business. Let's spend our security dollars and time on something more important. What else you got? 
Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. So don't ask them if you Too can make complicated it complicated technical yeah, questions. If you, yeah, if you can make it like a casual conversation, like you're well, because you are curious, right? Like mm -hmm. I still do the stride in my head. So I'm like, okay, so repudiation, like, can I figure out who did this? Or, you know, and you go through all the things, but I make it like a casual conversation. And I always start with, so if you were going to hack your app, how would you do it? And they always laugh. And then they look at each other and then evil comes out of their mouth. <laughs> yeah. Devs are all hackers. Just no one told them what they call a workaround. We in security people call a security incident. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, the they're problem thing... solvers. I mean, coding is problem solving at its core. It's yeah. I want to do this thing. What's the best, most efficient, most clever way to go about doing it in a lot of ways. And so their brain is already wired to do that. I, I remember I, I, I'm a management information systems major, so I was not a computer science major, Tanya, um, but I had to take one computer science class. And what I loved about it was exactly that, that problem solving kind of mindset that you have to approach everything you do. And even if you're writing, you know, relatively, relatively remedial uh, computer science 101 type apps in, in Java, which is what I was doing uh, 15 years ago, it's still like that there's that, that mental mm -hmm. effort to find ways around things or to get through things and that uh, it's interesting hearing you say that because they never put that together but it totally makes sense it's that same kind of mindset where people who are wired that way are really good at it yeah it actually took me a long time when i changed into security to be able to threat model because i kept thinking like a dev and i was like oh well we could just do this and it's like no, Tanya, what's the evil part? You're trying to make it work. I want you to make it not work. And my mentor would say, take off your dev hat. You're wearing it again. And I was like, oh, <laughs> be like, put on your black hat. Think like a hacker. And I'm like, I don't know how he's like, you do. It's in your brain. You have the problem solving skills, but you just keep going, looking at it from a dev perspective. And so now I can't not threat model everything like all the time, every single thing. I'm like, well, what about this and that? Mm. Yeah. The other thing that I really liked um, about some of the stuff that in your book was that I know that you target it towards application security, but it can also be applied kind of in information security as a whole. And I actually brought it up in one of our team meetings earlier this week where, you know, you talk about if your app breaks or if it gets hacked you have to have a backup but then also practice that rollback yes. you know and i brought that up to my manager in our team meeting i said you know we have this great incident response plan that we took some time and, and planned it out and we have it down on paper but mm -hmm. have we honestly table topped it have we walked yeah. through what we would actually do even if you're just like saying i'm going to go to this system i'm going to do this and i'm going to roll it back and but, and we haven't, right? And so I was like, well, maybe we should do that. Incident simulations are also really good too. Um, I worked at Elections Canada during the 2015 general election where we elected Trudeau. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, we, you know, had security incidents and such, but um, a thing that Elections Canada has been doing forever. So they've been doing elections for like 158 years or something, is they actually do an entire fake election six months before the real one. And we invited hackers in to, to be hackers at us. And we just threw security incidents in and all sorts of stuff. And so we actually like built an office, like a place where you would go and vote. We set up all the networking and everything and hammered at, like ironed out every single thing that could go wrong. And so when the actual election happened, it was funny on election day, I'm like looking at my peers. I'm like, so this is kind of anticlimactic. Like, like it was like it was great that you know it was cool. We spent so much time preparing, and then like nothing went wrong. <laughs> it was great, and like we were not in like I can't tell you details, but we were not in the papers, other than like you know this guy won and everyone's happy or well some people are happy some people aren't, but do you know what I mean? And um, mm -hmm. practicing for a security incident so. Oh my gosh, like we found so many problems with our process. Um, I actually am, 
I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I'm giving away a free incident response course. Can I like oh. plug it? Yeah, sure. Go, go for it. Um, so like at We Have Purple, we have this whole AppSec Foundations program and it's like, it's intense. But we're like, what if we made like little mini courses out of parts of it and then just gave it away for free? Because like, I kind of, I really like giving back to the community. So we made an instant response, like mini program. So it's like half of what we teach you because there's only so much time of yours we can take. Do you know what I mean? And so it's seven days and it's like, what is an incident versus an event? Like, how do you create a process? Why is a process important? Like, what is a postmortem? And we talk about rollbacks and we talk about like practicing them and why and how like a backup is valueless if you have no way to roll it back. Like for instance, like if you're using CI CD pipelines for your apps, like awesome sauce, did you back up your pipeline? Because the pipeline takes forever to perfect, to make it super perfect. And like, I'm, I'm in a retentive, like I practice all the things I preach. That's how I learn them. And so like, I have a backup of my own pipeline. So every time I make a change to it, it's automatically in GitHub and then it runs and does the thing. But so many places, they don't have their pipelines backed up. I'm like, how are you going to deploy your apps? What is, what is your rollback plan for your custom apps? Like you're going to just build your pipelines again perfectly. Is that what's going to happen? No. Do you remember how long it took you to make that pipeline? Yeah, it took weeks, right? And then like all the security things and all that, I'm like, back it up with your code, yo. Um, sorry, <laughs> I get like I'm on the high horse. <laughs> but anyway, okay, so if you want to get invited to the free courses, you go to newsletter.wehackpurple.com and you sign up for our newsletter. And we're doing two courses. So the other course is called Scaling Your Team. And so like how to make your AppSec program, security program, go farther and your team go further, but like without having more like dollars. <laughs> um, Cause stretching a dollar a mile is like one of my specialties because when I did AppSec, like I was like the first person doing AppSec at the company and they're like, so we're gonna give you zero dollars to work with. I'm like, great. Um, <laughs> and so like how <laughs> you can scale yourself, scale your team, scale your program. Um, and so, yeah, so basically if you join newsletter.wehackpurple.com, my marketing people will be very happy, but also um, like the courses are actually really good. One of them was like, I read the course. That's really good. We should charge for it. I'm like, you're the ones that want to give it away for free. It's for free. We've announced it. It's too late. <laughs> <sighs> so selfishly, you know, I, since we're trying to build an AppSec program sometime yeah. this year or maybe next yeah. year at my company, but we don't have any specialty in application security. I guess one of the questions I want to ask you is if I'm not a coder, if I'm not a dev, I, I'm a security guy, can I take your course and can you teach me all I need to do to at least start an AppSec program at my company? Will your course do that? Yeah. So the AppSec Foundations program is not hands-on it's about how to create a program and run it and then improve it and then improve it again and scale it um, and so it's made for anyone in IT so if you have no IT experience I think that it would not be a good fit um, but basically the three levels of the program so the first level you build a super super basic AppSec program uh, and then in the second level you add a lot to it and then you add measurements and metrics so that you can improve. So you can set kind of like three months, six months, 12 months and start measuring it. And then in the third level, we give you all the policies that you would want and like standards and guidelines and all the things to like fill out your program. And then also teach you about incident response, how to manage those, how to evaluate those every three months to make sure you can prevent as many as possible, et cetera. And then, and then you graduate and we put you off into the world. And, we try to help our grads find jobs. Um, but yeah, so far it's going really well. And also That's one awesome. of our grads hasn't found a job yet, just one. So if you want to meet him, let me know. <laughs> the rest of them so far are like, no, Tanya, no. People just like attacked me. <laughs> I, I joked that when I left Microsoft that like a white van was going to stop on the street and it was going to be some big IT company and they'd throw me in the back and be like, secure our apps. Because it's so hard to hire an AppSec person. It's like impossible. It's very hard, I think. You know, I, I've seen jobs when they come up, you know, and I see them and I'm like, well, I don't qualify because I'm not an AppSec person right now. So... Um, and I think they're few and far between for sure. The, um, so We Hack Purple also has a community and I haven't really been talking about it because it's been closed, but we 
are kind of just starting to open it back up. So we closed it for a few months because we moved it from one platform to another platform and I wanted to make sure we got it right and it was good and everyone actually came with us because it, it is hard to convince people to go from one platform to the other platform. And so like, I'm like, come on everyone over here, there's donuts. Um, and so, yeah, um, we actually have like a jobs channel. And so one of my co-op students goes through like a whole bunch of AppSec jobs each week and then is like, so this one's actually entry level. This one's actually beginner. This one's at like you you qualify to apply for this job if you graduate from this program. Um, and so nice. like he, he spends like two or three hours per week on that. And like, yeah, I think that when people take certifications, so like I see all these job things and they're like, you must have X number of certifications. And like my first certification is the one I made. So um, but I am in a special situation where I can say Google me in a job interview. Right. Like. Like if I'm brought in for a job interview, people have already heard of me. They can see my talks on the internet. But the average person, uh, so like I'm a weirdo. That is not a, a regular use case. The regular use case is like I've been studying on my own. I've had my little own home lab. I've been like trying really hard. Like maybe I study computer science or programming or some other area of IT. And then like I'm laser focused on this. And then you get certifications to try to like prove that you know something and i feel like certifications are big business they're big big business yeah and are. um yeah so our cert's free with the course haha -ha. <laughs> um because <laughs> oh, nice. i think that it no but i just <sighs> so like people get pe the whole reason people get a cert is because they just really want a job right and i feel like our industry our industry needs to be a little bit more realistic and like I don't want to say lower its standards, but be more realistic. Like if you have a senior AppSec person, you can hire a super junior AppSec person and then they will learn from them, right? Mm -hmm. And if you put them together and they job shadow a bit, like that person will catch on, people are smart. But if there's no one there with any AppSec experience, then hiring a junior person can be a bit dangerous. Do you know what I mean? But like. Mm -hmm. I feel there's lots and lots of companies where they would have room to mentor someone and train them, but they just don't want to put in the effort. They're like, I just want someone with 10 plus years experience doing exactly this tech stack, which has existed eight years and this and this and that. And it's like, it's almost like the HR firewall. I've heard people call it that, like I'm trying to get through the HR firewall. I really want to hire someone, but they, they say you have to have five different certs. They're like, you have to have a CISP or, you have to have the OSCP, which is like a networking, like pen testing, networking, smashing all the things. Really which really difficult to get. Yeah, which is very, very difficult. It takes on average four attempts to, to pass. And like, that's a lot of money and a lot of time. I, I believe it takes on average a year of studying to get it. It has nothing to do with AppSec. Why are you asking for it? Like, right. are you hiring a network penetration tester? Because yeah. That's perfect for that. But like an AppSec person, no, they don't need to know any of that crap. Like, and oh. it's like so weird because they're just like, well, we just don't know what to ask. And I'm like, why don't you just hire an AppSec consultant to come in and do the interviews for you? Like I've been, I've done that before where like I hired someone that knew more than me to do the interviews with me to tell me like that person's full of crap. That person <laughs> doesn't really know. Um, yeah. And when I left the, Canadian government, um, I really, I really adored my manager and she was really stressed out. Actually, it was my second last job in the government because my last manager, she really knew AppSec, but the one before she's like, I don't know AppSec, I was a DBA. And then I became a manager and I kind of like got the short straw and I'm in charge of the AppSec team. I don't even know what to ask in an interview. So I wrote questions for her. And one of the questions was, explain what one of the OAS top 10 is. Like I'm a dev and tell me how to fix it. And I'm like, if the person's condescending, they fail the interview. If the person can't clearly explain to you what the risk is and what the vulnerability is and how to fix it, they fail the interview. They get to pick which one of the OAS top 10. If you work in AppSec and you don't know any of the OAS top 10, you can leave now, right? Right. And I'm like, and if, if they can't explain it to you in a way, she's like, what well, if I don't understand? I'm like, then they suck at their, they suck. You don't want them. If they can't explain to you a super smart woman who was a DBA for like 20 years, then 
they don't deserve the job. The end. Yep. She's like, oh, Meg, you're the boss. <laughs> <laughs> You make this point in the book, too. You talk about soft skills and the importance of being able to communicate, being able to yeah. <clears throat> explain the risk or explain what the vulnerability actually is at a, at a simpler level or to somebody who has a different technical background. And yeah. that's something we hammer on this show all of the time. We talk about the value of soft skills all of the time and being a good person and being able to explain things to people in a non-condescending way, but in a collaborative way, in a growth mindset kind of way. And it's so, so important. And you made this point earlier in the show, but you talked about and, and I talk about this all the time. I'm, I'm in technical sales. So yes. when I go in and kind of give the Microsoft security pitch, one of the things we talk about, and you made this point as well, is the, the lack of talent available to move into security roles. That yeah. there is literally millions of open headcount everywhere. And if we could snap our fingers tomorrow and get a ton of talented people, it still wouldn't be enough. Yeah. And I, I think something that resonated in, in my head, and, and I'm going to make a sports analogy for a second, so apologies for any of our non-sports fans here, but my my school that I went to for college, Iowa State mm -hmm. University, has been terrible at our football our, our entire existence. And college football is kind of this, this program where everyone wants to go to the big brand names. They want to go to the big name schools. And so if you are not a big brand name, you have to develop talent. You have to bring in guys that have the ability to become good football players, but might not be there yet. And so for all these companies with this talent deficit, where if you're not a big name or you don't have the ability to cut big checks, you're going to have to have a talent development program, I think is really the path forward out of this, this talent deficit we have to get these security practitioners skilled up and in place. Companies have to adopt a mindset of they don't exist. So how can we create them? And when we do that, hopefully we will also open our doors to a more diverse set of candidates because the lack of diversity in InfoSec and AppSec and everything else is also horrible because the more people you have from different backgrounds, the different ways they would think about how to attack things or how to protect things. And yes. that's super valuable too. It's so true. So if you're just only going to listen to like one minute of this whole podcast, you should listen to that minute of Adam. Seriously, <laughs> seriously. I'm just going to nod my head for the rest. Be like, I disagree with Adam. It's so true. Everything you said, everything you said, I could not agree more. So we're about at the time. Um, before we wrap things up, Tanya, I do want them, our listeners, to uh, have you let them know where to find you on Twitter, LinkedIn, um, your website. So if you just want to let them know yeah. where they can find you as follow up, of course, we'll put all of that in the show notes as well. Okay, so if you look up She Hacks Purple, all one word, that's me all over the internet, on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube, everywhere. And if you look up We Hack Purple, that's my company. So wehackpurple.com is how you can get to the academy, the community. We even have a shop and we have really cute ladies hoodies that are pink and green and purple because I want them swag. Um, and so, and we have a podcast called We Hack Purple Podcast. Um, if you want to see my book, we're working on a website, aliceandboblearn.com, because ideally Alice and Bob are going to learn other areas of security. So they're going to probably learn DevSecOps and secure coding and all sorts of stuff. But that's going to take some time because, you know, I have to get over <laughs> trying to do the big <laughs> job of writing a book while running a company. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking like a break. Um, but <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, so just um we have purple.com and like she, i'm a lot on twitter like they're making a facebook page and like i don't like facebook and there's like an instagram page and i'm like uh don't you know that facebook owns them but like we have that stuff because the, the, mm -hmm. the marketing people are in charge of that <laughs> so you can visit us there if you desire <laughs> the marketing people are just like we're gonna string her up by her toes <laughs> <laughs> I volunteered to take on the Facebook and Instagram because Andy doesn't want to touch it. So for our podcast, I'm handling those. And for our listeners of the show who aren't watching the YouTube posting with video, I just want to let you know, Tanya is indeed wearing purple right now. So, <laughs> And I just I just had my bangs trimmed so you can see my face and my nice purple hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tanya, 
I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to me and Adam. It was a pleasure to have you on. I hope our listeners uh, check out your website, your book, learn a little bit more about application security. The YouTube video will be posted to our new channel once we get that taken care of. And all of our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any follow-up, definitely reach out to us. Um, both Adam and I have Twitter accounts, and Tanya, of course, her Twitter account. So uh, reach out to us if you have any questions or any follow-up uh, topics that you guys want to talk about. Thanks, and we'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.